Hey guys, welcome back to the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have two fascinating guests with me today. First, I have co-hosting with me, my good friend, Nikki, who's a, she's an independent researcher of psi phenomena and the afterlife. That's how we relate. And I figured she, I would have her on because she introduced my guest me, to me. And my guest is Mona Sabani. She is a, neuro, a cognitive neuroscientist who is a believer in the afterlife and psi phenomena. She holds a doctorate from the University of Southern California, completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Vanderbilt University with the MacArthur Foundation Law and Neuroscience Project, a former research scientist at the University of Southern California. She also was a scholar at the Sachs Institute for Mental Health, Law, Policy, Ethics, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, Vox, and other media outlets. She lives in Los Angeles, and her website is monasobaniphd.com. That's M O N A. S-O-B-H-A-N-I-P-H-D.com. And I want to give both of them a big welcome to the show. Ladies, thank you for coming on. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm super excited and honored to be here. Thank you. Um, so, Mona, I'll ask you this. Was, how did you go from uh, non-believer and kind of almost like skeptical to getting into this and becoming a believer? Yeah, it was a really long road. Um, <laughs> that's what... I guess it wasn't that long, actually, as I've been doing these interviews for the book, I've realized that people have been on longer journeys than me, but um, I'm also super intense. So I, when I got interested, um, I just dug into it and made it my like job to find out everything I could as quickly as I could um, and get caught up. But it, I was never into spirituality or um religion and I was just a hard you know hard-nosed materialist scientist um I mean I was inter I liked ghost stories but I don't think I believed in anything um super natural or paranormal but um I was also always aware that science has its limits um because I do science so I know all the limitations intimately um and yeah it was just like a a few different things in my life that happened, like a few life events that um, caused me to look at this stuff really carefully. And once I dug in, I I couldn't um, tear away. What would you say was the tipping point? Like what, what got you from going from, what, what turned you from skeptic to believer? Well, it wasn't just one thing. It was, I think, um, I mean, I, in the book, I, I try to document like the difficulty of, because essentially it's overturning a worldview. So um, it's it's pretty difficult actually. And it's like, you can accept pieces of of evidence and, and kind of dub them or tag them in your mind as, you know, anomalous and we can't explain this, but to do a whole worldview overhaul is, is really hard, like on you, like your ego, your identity, your body. So it took a while. Um, and like, we, we, you know, we all think you should be able to read evidence or like, even me as a scientist, I should have been able to read scientific studies and be convinced, but it just doesn't work that way. Cause your beliefs are so emotional, um, and are tied to your identity, which is like your, uh, <laughs> your brain is number one job is to protect its identity. So, um, it's really, so it took a lot of things, um, but most of all it took, I, I definitely needed the, the scientific evidence. Um, without that, I would have had a hard time. Um, but I also had a lot of personal experiences of getting really accurate intuitive readings. And my, my mother um, does divination and she's really good. So it was a lot, a lot of that kind of um, personal experience also that is so I needed both for me it was both so there was not like one event really you're you're Persian I'm, I'm actually Lebanese like my last name is Khalil but um I was wondering um so it's some like similar cultures but is that is there like a psi or paranormal aspect to that culture like is because uh, you said your mother does divination so obviously it's ingrained in your culture somewhere right Yes. Yeah. We have, um, so for us, it's, you're probably familiar. It's, um, we use Armenian or Turkish coffee or Greek mm -hmm. coffee. It's yeah. called different things. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like this thicker coffee that you drink and leave the grounds at the bottom of the cup, flip it, let it dry. And there's pictures. And then some, if you're lucky to have like an intuitive reader, they can look into it. And my grandmother used to do it and my, my mom does it. So that was always in our family it was just in the background it was always at family parties but I never understood 
paid attention to it. You know, you grow up with something, you don't really notice it. Um, and it wasn't until graduate school when I, my mom started, we would have coffee together and then she would just flip the cup and just start saying things. And I was like, what's going on? <laughs> and I, but I, and I didn't really believe it. Or I was like, oh, is it like, this is what you've been doing for everyone all this time. Um, but over the years, I, I just kind of tracked what she said and she really turned out to be more right than she was wrong. And I just noticed a lot of things would come true. And that um, I could never explain it with science, but um, I, I, you know, observed, took notes and, and eventually came to, I just, it works. I mean, is, is all I can say it works, but yeah, we have that as part of, part of our culture. It, it's weird, right? It's, it's so hard to prove this. And Nikki, you had relatives in your family. Like, it sounds like you had a of like a similar background. Like you had like psi phenomena in your background too. Right? Oh yeah. 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 My aunt and uh, my grandparents, I'm Italian. So they're very superstitious in the culture. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of that. How did Mona, how did you get out of your own way? You know, like your own mind. Like, I feel like that's the hardest thing for me to do. And I've heard you mention journaling before. Um, how even with the evidence and like your life experiences and you know this is real, it's still really hard to get out of your own way. Yeah, and I would say that I, 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 I don't abandon that part of myself. I mean, I keep try to keep both sides, um, the rational, skeptical, I hate that word now, but rational, skeptical side um, and the intuitive side. And I just try to balance them. It's a practice for sure. Yeah. I, I journal a lot. <laughs> it's like, and I think for me, writing the book helped a lot because I was yeah. so confused <laughs> about what I, who I was and what I believed in and what all the different evidence says that, I mean, it just takes a while. And that's why it's like, I try to, um, genuinely, I try to look at my former self with compassion. And then anyone who's like in this space talking about this stuff, like all you can do is you can't, you can't really be exasperated with other people because, um, like if you've gone through it, you know how hard it is. And so and we, we shouldn't be like that anyway, because it is, it, these, this is like the biggest, um, mystery of being here. And it's not like there's going to be a simple answer. So right? well, I was going to ask you, like, what was your, um, like, what made you start actually believing that there was an afterlife? Because I, I've had past life regressions done for me. I've had, um, you know, a lot of different energy work and stuff like that, but more so like I had the past life regressions and that kind of gave me an, an idea, but, and, and I've always felt like I've had a soul, like that it just feels like there's a soul in, inside me that's everlasting, but I'm not, I'm still not sure. Like I'm, even though I've interviewed all these people, I'm still skeptical about it. Like, do you feel the same way or do you, are you a firm believer that there's an afterlife? So I'm, I'm like you where I think, okay, so I, this one does have a, a story um, <clears throat> of when I became more of a believer and I'll tell that in a minute, but it's um, that I think there's the least amount of evidence I would say for concrete proof of an afterlife. And I think the, the best proof comes from, in my opinion, um, mediums um, and, you know, I, in my opinion, so if they can, which is of course not good scientific proof, <laughs> <laughs> but it's in my personal experience, it's the best proof. Okay. So here's my story. So I, so there's a lot of theories around um, people who claim they're mediums and they get information about people who have passed away. Um, there's something called like the super psi hypothesis. You, you guys probably know about this, um, but where you're, you're getting information, like it, it's true that psi is possible and there's information out there and you're receiving it. And it's not necessarily that there's a disembodied consciousness that's like still alive in some way communicating with you. And so that I think hasn't been resolved. Um, but for me personally, and so I don't, I kind of, I, as far as I'm aware, I mean, if you guys know of any evidence and want to point me in that direction, I'm happy to, <laughs> to take recommendations. Um, but my story is this. So I had a mentor, actually the mentor who convinced me to write the book. Um, he passed away last year from COVID and in November. And I, um, in December, I had a friend come over, the person who, who um, sent my book to his publisher. And this is a friend who I kind of knew was like psychic medium, but um, I, 
I wasn't aware of the depths of his skills. Um, and we, we didn't talk every day or anything. I just, as a gesture of gratitude, um, invited him and his husband over um, for dinner, you know, for the holidays. And they they came over and and I hadn't they I hadn't even mentioned to them that my mentor passed away. And even if I had, he actually he didn't know who he was. So this like he he doesn't really know what's going on. But he came in and started just telling me like kind of quickly, you know, kind of like I don't know if it was channeling or whatever, just saying like there's like a male presence here. Did you like does somebody really close to you pass away recently? Um, and he just started like word vomit, like <laughs> all the facts of like. Um, his personality, how he was, his messages for me. And I was just standing there like in total shock. <laughs> and I was like, I, like, and I had to tell him, I'm, yeah, my, my mentor just passed away. But like, how did you know, like, how did you know that? I, or like, how are you getting this? And he was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm like, I have, um, he's like, you know, I have these abilities. I don't know if I told you or whatever. And he just like, and he said a few things that were really validating that just blew, blew me away. Like I, like that week, I, this is getting really personal, but we're here. So that week I was discussing with my therapist. Um, I was like, you know, um, I'm doing better with this death than with <laughs> the other deaths I've dealt with in my life. And so like, I was talking about that with her. It was something that was on my mind. I was like, oh, maybe I'm getting better at this. And he actually, so my friend, when he came over for dinner, he was saying, your, your mentor is saying, look how much better you are at dealing with his yes. passing than with the, um, you know, the other passings you've dealt with in your life. And I was just staring at him. Like I was literally talking about this with my therapist yesterday. <laughs> that is so weird. And he also said, this was the other one that was crazy. He, I didn't find out that my mentor passed away for a week. Um, because, well, I don't, well, I think everyone was just kind of flustered and, and I, I just, nobody told me <laughs> for a week and I had texted him and he hadn't replied to a text and I thought he was mad at me. And, and anyway, so then so I didn't tell my friend that the one who was over for dinner and he goes and he tells me, he's like, you didn't find out immediately and you're upset about it. And he's like, but there's a reason for that. And he's like, what was going on that week for you? It has something to do with your book. And that, and I had to really think about, I had to pull up my calendar that I couldn't even remember. And I looked and I was like, oh my goodness, the day that he passed away that I didn't know yet, I got edits back from my editor and I had to send the edits back to her by a week later. And so as soon as I sent the edits, I found out he passed away. Wow. <laughs> and oh so, gosh. yeah. And so my friend said, was like, you know, it was, it was meant to be that way. Don't be, don't be, you're like upset about that. Just let it go. So well, sorry for the loss of your mentor. That's, that's always rough. Like who was your mentor? Um, we were friends on a, we, on the board of this nonprofit here in LA, but um, after school programs for the underserved in like a lot of the LAUSD schools. So we were on this board together for years um, and we were friends first and foremost. And then the last couple of years, he was um, noticed I was struggling. I was going through my existential crisis and he was going to help me with my career portion of that. And so we became um, close in that way. And he was kind of mentoring me and he kind of, he did this for a lot of people. He actually had a whole mentee program, um, that he would help people. So, yeah. And, and also did you, it seems like you studied in the Brian Weiss. Who, I love Brian Weiss's work and also Dr. Jeffrey Kripal. Um, mm -hmm. did you, what did you think of, uh, I was going to ask you what you thought of many lives, many masters by Brian Weiss and, and how Jeffrey Kripal's work, or if you want to talk about how either of them affected your, your belief and, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So actually my whole journey started with many lives, many masters and the, it's, it's a, it's a, like the story goes like this. So I, uh, I think I was going to intuitives for readings during this crisis and, um, was sort of believing, not believing, um, and they would mention reincarnation past lives, but I didn't know anything about that. So I just ignored it. Um, uh, I would write it down, but I didn't pay attention to it. And then months, I wasn't doing any research or anything. I was just existing. And then months later, I was randomly listening. I wasn't listening to anything spiritual at this time at all. Um, so I was listening to Chelsea Handler had this podcast based on her book that had come out called, um, 
life will be the death of me. And most of it was about personality and therapy and the Enneagram and stuff like that. But then one episode, she had Laurel and Jackson on, who's a psychic medium and Chelsea Andler's a was a skeptic. And so I was like, whoa, why does she have a psychic medium on? And the Laurel and Jackson starts um, describing the framework, the like earth is a school, we come to learn lessons. And I would, I kind of perked up and I was like, oh, I heard this before. Um, it was what the intuitives told me that I had ignored. And so I, I like kind of wrote down what she was saying, because I just wanted to think about it, look back at the readings and see if they made more sense. And then on the podcast episode, um, they tell, they don't, they talked about the book, Many Lives, Many Masters. And they're like, everyone has to read this book. And Chelsea tells this funny story that she um, like got in a fight with a friend over dinner. Like a friend was telling her that she had to read it. And she was like, this is garbage. Like, this isn't true. Like, how dare you suggest I read such a terrible book? And then got on a plane right after dinner to fly from New York to LA. And I'm, probably, I'm like telling her story. I'm probably telling it wrong. Um, and then I think she, the book was in the pocket um, of the seat in front of her. Um, right after she had a fight with her friend. And so then she read the book because it was there um, flying home and then loved it. And she said, when she got back to LA, she was like, everyone has to read this book. So they didn't say what it was. I ordered it. It came, I read it. And I was like, a psychiatrist case study sounds right at my alley. I'm a neuroscientist. Um, yeah. And then I, it was past my progression. And I was like, what am I reading? This is the weirdest book I've ever read, but it, um, it also piqued my interest because he talked about it was two things. One was that spiritual framework again. He's like, oh, the masters came through and said, we're here to learn lessons. And then the second thing was that this, these alleged spirits like had information about his life. So it was kind of tapping into that like intuitive psychic phenomena. And so I was sitting there like, oh my God, this like Yale, Yale Columbia trained psychiatrist has wrote this book. And so that really got my attention and so I went to read the rest of the other part that I was interested in was the healing part that like actually reliving these past lives healed his patient so I went and read the rest of his books and then a, a lot of past life regression other authors and um so that's how and then that was like the domino effect like <laughs> that was like the reading never stopped after that and um for Jeff Kripal I'm not even sure how I stumbled across his work, but um, the first book I read was is called The Flip, and it's about scientists who flip <laughs> through personal experience. So it's like it was written for me. And I once I found it, and I found it actually later in the journey um, towards maybe even after I had submitted the book's manuscript, but uh, I found it and I was like, oh my God, this is the this is the work. I had been missing that ties everything together because it ties in together spirituality and paranormal stuff, but includes like um, what's wrong with the materialist worldview and how it all collides and clashes and whatever. I, to me, he's brilliant and really succinctly and intellectually describes the problem that we find ourselves in. And I think um, before I found his work, because he's a um, the chair of philosophy and religious studies at Rice University, I was very in the science world. I was like, how do we expand science? And it wasn't until I read his work that I was like, oh yeah, of course we have to include the humanities because the humanities have a lot of this, right? In anthropology and ethnobotany, there's a lot of um, stories that pulls all this stuff together. That's so interesting. Did you have a question, Nikki? Oh yeah, I want to ask you, how do you think the synchronicities tie into that? Like how you were saying your friend that book just presented itself, you know, it, despite her not wanting to read it. Like, how do you think the synchronicities tie in? It feels like it, they're almost just like these signals blinking in your face of like, you have to pay attention to this. Do you think there's some sort of divine timing with that? Like, we'll get the things I as do. we're ready. I do. I do now. <laughs> I really do because it's just weird. I mean, and it's like, we're, we may never be able to prove it. A neuroscientist is always going to say, and this is like something I would have, this is stuff I did struggle with in the beginning, I would, I would be like, we can't prove it. We can't prove it. I just kept like hitting a wall. And then it, it just took a while to finally accept, okay, there's some, some things we just can't prove. Like, I'm never going to be able, we're never going to be able to prove that, but it doesn't, but let it go. Like if yeah. there's meaning in the moment for you, then just accept it. And I do think though, it's, you know, I think some things are just too coincidental. Like when I think about it statistically like it just 
I don't know. It doesn't make sense, but. What I was going to say is it seems like, do you think guys think, and you, I'd like to get both your opinions on this. Do you think like death is supposed to be a mystery? Do you think we're not supposed to figure this stuff out? <laughs> I kind of do. Cause sometimes I, but I don't know. I don't know what you think. I, I don't know. Sometimes I just feel like the universe is a paradox on purpose. So <laughs> I'm like, if we were supposed to know, we'd know. Yeah. What know. do you think, Nikki? I think it is frustrating. I, and I really feel for some reason, a large sense that I will find out all of these things after I die. And I'm just like, no, I want to know now. Like I'm, I'm an impatient person. I'm an excited person. And I'm excited about this. And it's like, I want to unravel it all. I want to open it up like a Christmas present and know everything like right this second, you know, yeah. but I feel like things, I don't know. I have this huge sense that like things you're not going to know until you get to that point in the road. And that's that like, it's real frustrating to me. Nikki's also a, 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 she loves that book by Laurel and Jackson. She, yeah. she actually introduced me to that book as well. I haven't read it yet, but if you got, if you want to talk about it, Nikki, or what. Oh I, yeah. I do have a lot of questions um, for you surrounding that because a lot of things clicked in my head whenever I was reading um, Laurel and Jackson's book and how she specifically says her psychic abilities come into her at certain places on her head mm -hmm. and I know that you did studies with like places of the brain and activity so I'd really love to get your thoughts on that because it really helped me to understand the things that were happening to me personally whenever she mapped it out like you know okay. if she was talking to someone that passed she would see it here behind her mm -hmm. yeah yeah um I'm really interested in that too it's um the Winbridge Institute is the research center that does research with psychic mediums and they certified her and they did a bunch of studies with her and other me, um, mediums and I pulled actually their quotes from their research paper and put it in my book because I, I was like I don't know if anyone else is as interested in this as, as I am but I was so interested in exactly what you said because it's, it's just an interesting detail they'll be like oh psychic information comes in on my left medium mm -hmm. information comes in on my right and they'll just have like delineations of like if it's from the mother's side it's in the top and if it's from yeah. the father's side it's on the bottom and you're like what are you what like why are there <laughs> these distinctions but they are and a lot of them describe those kinds of things and they describe the difference in the kinds of energy like they'll say psychic energy is more dense I think um heavier and a potential like it's more like a potential and then I guess mediumistic information is more um actually I don't remember how they describe it but it's like I think lighter um and so it's it's just fascinating I mean I don't know what it means um there there's um there are some I haven't been able to find the study but I spoke to um, uh, Whitley Schreiber, who, Schreiber, who, um, uh, you know, he's a, yeah, he's a, he's a big name. I, I love Whitley Schreiber. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I did his podcast, but he, um, mentioned Gary Nolan, um, of Stanford. They, they've done studies with experiencers and they've done brain studies with them. And, um, and they said that there's like something like hyperconnectivity in this part of the like deep inside this deep part of the brain that does help pull everything together. Mm -hmm. And so one of their, well, I don't know what one of their theories is because I couldn't find the paper, um, <laughs> but hopefully they'll publish it or I can get my hands on it soon. Um, but yeah, I know that they were looking at that, but it doesn't really answer. Um, I actually think it's a different issue because I still think it's interesting that they perceive um, directionality uh, mm -hmm. and and I don't, yeah, I don't have an explanation for it, but I just think it's super fascinating. Well, it from is. a neuroscientist perspective, or even your spiritual perspective, whichever you want to answer, like, what do you think is going on with contact? I mean, like, I'm sure you had a good conversation with Whitley. Like, I mean, like, for, like do you think that's happening something with consciousness? Or do you think, even if we, if we looked at it from a spiritual level, is it happening on an astral level, maybe? Or like, you know what I mean? Like, what, yeah. I know we could just speculate, but it's so yeah. interesting, right? Yeah. I mean, I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's so many people have so many theories, but yeah, it's all, um, I mean, to me, it's all consciousness. So, but why consciousness, your consciousness gets altered in that way to have these experiences, I think is really the more interesting question. Um, and yes. I think in some ways only you can answer that. Like, or I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure people can help you find meaning out of it, but I think the more interesting question of, are these things true, true or not, or real or not, is what does it mean for you? Like, how does it relate to your life? Because I think that's 
in, like probably why it's happening, right? No, I think you're exactly right. Because a lot of people find like spiritual transformation from their experiences, right? Right, right, right. It, it, it changes the course of their life. They're extremely transformative in some way. As often, sometimes they're um, transformative in a positive way. Sometimes not. <laughs> sometimes yeah. they are. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, now, I wanted to ask you, like, when you look at like different areas of psi phenomena, like psychokinesis, telekinesis, remote viewing, have you looked into these and like, do you find proof in like a, a lot of them or? Uh, yeah, I, so um, when I was doing research, I, I did find a lot of like, I read a lot of books. I, I spoke, to, I read the books of the Stargate, um, like the US government funded research program into psychic phenomena. I spoke to them, I read their papers. Um, and and then I found a meta-analysis and um, published in 2018 that looks at all of the lab-based um, psi phenomena. And meta-analysis basically means it just pulls together all of the research that's been done, categorizes it, and then uh, or, I'm sorry, it was a review. It was a review of meta-analyses, small difference. But anyway, yeah, it pulls together all the papers um, and actually looks at the effect sizes and was like, is this a real phenomenon? And based on that review and all the meta-analyses, it seemed like it was as real as any of the things we study in psychology and neuroscience, like the effect sizes were comparable. So um, yeah, so at first I was trying to read all these like disparate sources. And then one day I was like, oh, I'm just gonna check Google Scholar. <laughs> like I found a found a review and I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. And it was relatively recent. So it had pulled done the work for me. It pulled it all together. And it made sense to look at it in that way because if it was any other scientific phenomena, like if I wanted to, like I talk about in my book, if I wanted to look up the neural correlates of empathy for pain, which is a very popular topic, um, I would look for the most recent review or the most recent meta-analysis, and that would go over everything, the entire literature. So I was lucky that in yeah, 2018, they had published this review, and they were just like, yeah, I mean, it's a real effect, as real as anything else we study. It's just that it um, comes up against the worldview. Um, scientific materialism so do you believe that we have like chi like um or prana like i the reason why i asked that is like I, when i was talking about psychokinesis like i've watched videos where i've seen people bend spoons with their mind i've seen people move buckets of water that were like five feet away but just by like using their energy i mean i've seen some really st interesting stuff that wasn't like faked you know so i was thinking like is that like our chi or energy or prana that's like moving that or is that consciousness or if you had to guess what would you think i know it's so hard to right it's yeah. like yeah i mean you know i don't know but <laughs> um yeah because like, because yeah it could be either or but i know that the institute of noetic sciences is doing some studies looking at subtle energy and um i write like one blog a month for them so uh, helping them translate their scientific um findings so i, I was they're, they just did a study like, and the problem with, there's not been a, not a lot of research been done in this, this field. So things like subtle energy or like uh, um, like uh, energy healing, there's the studies are like a mess, you know, <laughs> they're not well-funded. So they're trying to get like, see if they can, if they get, you know, a few energy healers and they get observers, do, can they describe the same thing? Like, is there, can they standardize this kind of invisible? Cause there's no way to measure it with devices yet. So all we can do is use people who claim that they can see it and detect it, get their descriptions and then compare the descriptions. So I know they're working on that a little bit and maybe hopefully that'll help answer that question in the future. But yeah, I mean, it could also all just be consciousness. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Nikki, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I would like to know what you think of, I know you have a huge background in mental health, and I wonder if you see any type of correlation to what we label as a mental disorder and psychic phenomena. So the example I'm thinking of specifically is like Philip K. Dick, and he was cons considered a schizophrenic, but he had these great storylines and he claimed to see parallel dimensions i don't know if you've ever seen man in the high castle but it was just it's just really cool um so i wonder if you see any correlation to that and things that we consider mental disorders but could be something else yeah um there's actually a lab 
at Yale called Cope Lab that's looking at this. And it's really interesting. It's a neuroscientist or a psychiatrist. Oh, I can't remember. Somebody with a neuro background. <laughs> um, and then a um, energy healer, a psychic energy healer. And they're, she and she's also a, um, a therapist, I think. Um, and so they're like doing this project together and they're looking at people who hear voices. Um, and there's people who have a mental disorder who hear voices and then people like her who hear voices, but are sane or they don't, aren't classified as mentally ill. They're, they don't have to seek treatment for that. And they're comparing, um, I can't remember if it was imaging work um, or if it was um, EEG, but they're comparing the, you know, these groups to see what's a difference. And I think his, this is from a neuroscience perspective, his um, running hypothesis is that people who have a framework to understand the information that's coming in to them um, end up not having a mental disorder. And then the people who don't, because um, that's one difference they found between the groups is that they had some sort of like conceptual um, idea of what was happening to them um, or ha framework for it to come through, whether it's religion or something else. Um, and then the ones who don't, it's, it's like a mess, but okay. So they're doing that work from a spiritual perspective. I, so I, I spoke to them and I asked her that because <laughs> I was like, you and I, I mean, I have no idea, mm -hmm. um, but she says she doesn't know. She's like, I don't know. <laughs> She's like, I really don't know if it's that, you know, like some people just can't understand, um, the information that they're getting. So, yeah. So would, would that be like, we're gonna, would we get an autistic person have like, maybe like, well, we can maybe consider them like some, they might have, they have obviously some kind of like abilities, right? Like, it seems like it, like as compared to like us looking at them as they have like a disability, but it's like, you, you could, they can do like really weird, mirac not miraculous, but like really weird things. Like I've heard them being able to pick winners of like sporting events and, horse races and stuff like that. Like, what do you think that is? I mean, like, if you had to guess, like, is that just like an unknown? Um, actually, there's a book called, it's on my couch, actually. It's called mm -hmm. Irreducible Mind. Um, I'm reading it, but it's huge. It's, I'm getting through it. So um, there's actually th uh, three huge books, Irreducible Mind, um, oh shoot, what's it? Oh, Beyond Physicalism and Consciousness Unbound. And they're written by, um, like a consortium of scholars from Esalen. So Esalen pulled together and Jeff Kripal's part of it and Ed Kelly from University of Virginia and all these other researchers. And um, they put together all the evidence from psychology, from neuroscience, and then from paranormal and spirituality, like all together and run through it. And they talk about that, like savants and genius and the idea of, you know, where do these, um, these ideas come from or where, where do these abilities come from? So. Um, I tend to lean towards their work just because it's so well researched. Um, and they, I, I think they posit, and I mean, I'm still, I'm still reading it. I'm still on the genius chapter. <laughs> it's a really big book. Um, and it's very academic, so it's not an easy read. Um, but yeah, they talk about how they think it's, um, it's that, 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 you know, that one other model is not that our minds are constrained to our brains. It's that our minds or our consciousness expand, you know, beyond physicalism and that in some people, in some States, you can access like meditation or psychedelics or hypnagogia. You can access um, more information and other information than you normally can. So I think that's kind of their running hypothesis. That's and so interesting. I guess that's where I'm leaning to. Um, you can ask a question if you want, Nikki. I'm, I, I don't, I'm sorry. Oh, I do have a question. Um, so if, so the spirits, as far as this is going to just sound really weird. So I have a preface with that. I feel like I get signs from yard sales and estate sales, because that's my thing. That's what I go and do. I love going. And I feel like the spirits kind of will meet you at your place. Um, as far as giving you signs, like you mentioned the coffee grounds, but do you feel that that's true? Like if you're a person that listens to the radio a lot and you're always listening to songs, then they'll come through whatever you want to call it. The, the powers that be will come through and give you a song that you're like, oh, I know this is a sign. Or if I'm at yard sales, you know, like I'll see something that is an obvious sign that I absolutely can't deny. I know in my heart that it is, but do you feel that that's true is that they will just kind of 
find you no matter what sort of tools that you're using. Yeah, I think so. I think they, I think they, I definitely think that they do that <laughs> because, and it's also like, I mean, your brain that does have, have filters um, and the, the things you like, the things you're interested in filter the information coming in. So in some ways, if they're, you know, yeah, the, it, they would have to do that, I guess, in some ways, but a good, um, oh, I feel, I don't know. I'm like thinking about my story with, um, I put this in the book, but after I, I did, um, after I started reading everything and I was kind of deciding if I should jump into this and do like a full blown, like start interviewing people, start researching this more, or should I stop? Um, I remember I was like, oh, let me um, ask for signs. And then this is just an example. Cause I was like, and you know, I was like, oh, I'll ask for a butterfly or a flower or whatever, but then I would forget what I asked for. And um, I was starting to realize I was like, oh my God, like um, I'm not choosing meaningful signs, but I don't know what I mean. I hadn't read Laurel and Jackson's book yet, <laughs> signs, um, which I love her suggestion of like pick two things and put them together and make it really distinct, right? Like that's a great thing. Um, like I hadn't thought about that. And then, so I kept forgetting. So I, I actually asked the universe, like I was like, if you want me, if, if I should continue this, you have to give me a really big sign that I won't miss. Like just whatever, whatever would get my attention. Um, I'm going to leave it to you. And then two days later, I went to dinner with friends and my friends called me when I was like on the way over and they're like, Where, are you near the, the restaurant? We need you to get here quickly. And I'm like, why? And they're like, Chelsea Handler's here. <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> done <laughs> and like to me that was such a you know like that was such a huge sign and I felt like it was one of those things it was like I felt like the universe was like what will get her attention and <laughs> and that's related to the question that she's asking right and it was like it was Chelsea Handler's story and podcast that made me even pay attention to this so it was very yeah. meaningful so I totally think it's fine-tuned for you yeah that's really cool. I know I got, I get a lot of those signs too. And I'm a stubborn person and your rational mind always wants to rationalize them away. So sometimes I get them so repeatedly that it's just like, they're shouting it from the rooftops. Like I have to pay attention to this and I journal it. I write it all down and it really does help me keep my sanity about it. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on like a, like a creator of all if that fits in your research, or do you think, let me ask you going a step further, or do you think we're in some kind of like matrix type environment? Like, I mean, that's a big thing now. It's, you know, I interview a lot of people that talk like that we're in a simulation, or do you think there's a, a, it's more biological and that we have a creator of all that's like done all this? Um, I don't, I don't personally tend to think of it as a creator, creator. I think of it as um, I guess, I guess what I, okay, this, this I heard recently and it kind of resonated with me. I do think the universe is participatory in that it communicates with you or like part is part of us or we are it. Um, and I think that you don't even need spirituality. I think a lot of actual cosmologies are, are indicating that like physics and, um, stuff like that. So, I think that's true. And then, oh, what was the thing I was going to, oh, um, um, oh, that's right. Okay. I heard this from like a, a guy giving a psychedelic talk, um, but he was talking about how it's, po if I do think the universe is probably like a consciousness, it's kind of how I think of it and that it creates um, other versions of itself as in us <laughs> and our lives to possibly to learn and evolve, but to grow itself, but also to like, it might just be bored. <laughs> and like existing, my existence might just be boring and it creates all these versions of itself um, for entertainment and possibly growth. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I just kind of thought that was like, yeah, if I, if I were the universe and just there alone, I would probably do the same thing. Yeah. Do you think we have like, I, I get all kinds of like Mandela effects all the time. And like, I don't know, I got, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm real superstitious, but I mean, like, do you think that, um, or where was I going with that? Um, I just lost, I totally lost my train of thought, but the, the Mandela effect, um, like the multiverse. Uh, sorry. Do you have a question, Nikki? I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah. Have, I, have you witnessed any Mandela effects yourself, Mona? 
Um, I have not, <laughs> but I have a, um, <laughs> I work with this, one of my um, colleagues um, is all about them. <laughs> yeah. Tells me about all of his experiences. Like he has the one with Chick-fil-A. Um, I oh, guess. I don't know that one. What's the one with Chick-fil-A? I guess, oh gosh, now I don't even, I don't know how Chick-fil-A is spelled, but he, if it's C-H-I-C-K or C-H-I-C, whichever one it is, he says it was always the other one. <laughs> oh, gosh, right. Yeah, they changed the logo or something. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I haven't experienced, I haven't noticed anything like that yet. Like there was the, like the Bernstein Bears one. I know that was a Mandela effect. But I was going to ask you, I remember what I was going to ask you now. I was going to ask you about parallel realities, which you thought about that. Like, that's an interesting one too, right? That like we could be make like every decision we make spawns off into a reality, whereas the decision right. we didn't make could have been a different reality. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's a very real possibility, even in physics, like the idea of the multiverse. Um, so I, I think that's a possibility. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't have an opinion on it because I, yeah. I, I don't know, <laughs> but it's an interesting thought. Yeah, they are. It really is. Um, yeah. well, I don't have any other questions. Do you have any other questions, Nikki? Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for just to keep your own sanity and your spiritual practice to, to, you know, just get out of your own way and kind of let yourself go deeper into this and let your heart open and realize your path? Yeah, I, um, I, so I guess on a personal level, you could just like, we talked about ask for signs. Um, I still do that <laughs> all the time. I, sometimes I wake up, I mean, now I feel like after that, um, that friend that I mentioned that came over for dinner and I've had so many experiences with him that I'm just like a they're <laughs> solid believer I guess because there's just no other explanation for what he can know about my life um but uh I used to and I guess I still do sometimes like ask for science all the time and I always invite like even in my book I I, I invite people to um drop you know drop the shackles of materialism and embrace the mystical and the spiritual in whatever way that is for you for some people they're just comfortable meditating and that's fine um but if you are open to getting a reading of some kind like if you can find someone who like get a recommendation of somebody good i i kind of want people to do more of that just because i think that what again the personal experience is way more powerful like when you're sitting there and someone tells you something very spot on and intimate about your life, the goosebumps that you get and like the, you know, your emotions and your <laughs> like sweating and your heart rate is like nothing beats that. Um, and, and again, to like, when you find that thing coming, that materialist mindset coming up of, oh, but I'm creating meaning. It doesn't mean anything. It does mean something. Those goosebumps and that sweat and that emotion is not meaningless. And it doesn't have to be spiritual. It's just, if you feel something in a, that moment, any emotional moment is a meaningful moment and um, you should just embrace it and lean into it. I so, like that. Do, so do you, uh, my last question is, do you think we can train psi abilities? Like, do you think we can, like- I think so, I mean, from what I've read, you can, oh, actually, Julia Mossbridge is a cognitive neuroscientist who studies this um, stuff, and she has a website, um, I mean, just, I don't know, Google her, her name, I can't remember yeah. her website, but she wrote a book called The Premonition Code, and she has, it's like an app, I think, and she has a website where you can um, test your psi abilities, and I think you can train on them, too, if I'm not That's mistaken. cool. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Julia Mossbridge, um, Premonition Code, the book. I don't because remember. Her, so. I'll tell you what, we're both coming into our abilities. Like, it seems like it. Like, I know I'm, I'm getting more intuitive every day, and I, I, I don't think I could do a reading for someone, but, like, I do feel like you know, my psychic abilities are increasing. The more I research, the more I meditate, it just seems like it's all coming together. Is, is that for you too, Nikki? I mean, do you feel? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The more that I allow myself to go that direction, the more it opens up. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the I just remembered the research shows that the more you do it, the more it works for you. And also the more you believe in it, the more it works for you. That's what the research has shown. 
I think that's true because I, I think like when if you open yourself up to even believing in like things like spirits and stuff, you might be able to have more experiences with spirits too, like or, or connect with your relatives that have passed, right? Yeah, yeah. I do think it, the more you open to the universe, the more it opens to you. It's so cool. Um, it's beautifully said. <laughs> sorry. Oh, no, I just said that's beautifully said. That's all. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so, well, I don't have any other questions. This was so fun. I, I really I really enjoyed this. Can you tell everybody um, how to find your book? Oh, what, what, can you tell people before we go about the book real quick? And, uh, but, and yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the book is just um, my personal story. So when I was going through everything um, and I was confused and like I'm very <laughs> upset about everything, um, I found a lot of books with just facts. So this is the book I wish I had, which was like a person going through the transformation. So um, I include a lot of the scientific evidence and and personal evidence that convinced me ultimately. Um, and then also tried to document like <laughs> how it was affecting me along the way and how difficult it was. But how I ultimately came to accept it. So it's called Proof of Spiritual. I have it here actually. <laughs> Proof of Spiritual Phenomena. I'm not crazy about the title or the cover, but um, <laughs> that is what it is. Um, but yeah, you can find um, links to order the book. It's sold wherever books are sold on my website, monasavaniphd.com. And uh, I also write in Altered States of Consciousness Psychedelics newsletter that talks about a lot of this stuff. And that's also on my website. All right. Well, uh, thank you both for doing this. And, uh, and yeah, and uh, thank you and have a good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.